get screen share. All right, so we'll we'll finish up the Trinity um, series, and we'll just keep it to three parts, which I kind of feel has like is appropriate. Um, I I found this little graphic here, and maybe you've seen it. It's you know the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and all that. But it He is God, so the Son is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So it's like separate, but um, the same. It's um, just kind of like a graphic to, uh, you know, huh? It is kind of mind bending, you know, the whole idea of the Trinity is, is, is mind bending and it's not something that we can, you know, like fully grasp, but you know, those are the things that we see in the scripture. So just to kind of a quick re recap, and really what I wanted to do with this series is not so much go into like everything that the Bible says about the Trinity, um, you know, in the New Testament, but really kind of like show the building blocks in the Old Testament, because I think that there's a, a, a lot of people treat the, the Trinity idea as a Christian idea, but not a Jewish or like that. The, it's not an Old Testament idea. It's, it's really a New Testament idea or that, that it was somehow new. And that is completely false. So, um, so really, I wanted to kind of like build up an understanding, you know, um, from the Old Testament and from uh, old um, Israelite and, and Jewish um, culture, where they understood these things. Um, so the building blocks, of course, of course, for the multi-person God is from the Old Testament, and we saw how the writers deliberately use. Um, things that almost don't make sense in the sentence just to kind of um, get your attention and show you things like where they use an awkward singular slash pearl first and third person person type of language to convey that they are the one and the same person that they're talking about. We also saw that 3D uh, analogy or we we talked about, you know, like um, um, that the that the cube or the fidget spinner and that like some people are, uh, you know, if you can imagine us being only caught in, you know, two dimensions and we can't see the extra thing going on there, we can get descriptions of it and kind of understand it, but we really um, are going to um, find out a lot more, you know, in the next life about it. We also, um, we found that like an attribute or something that comes from God is equated with God, like things like his wisdom, his love and glory. And from the first page of the Bible, we see the signs of the Trinity. So from page one, um, you know, you already have God um, making the heavens and the earth, but then you see his spirit hovering over the waters. And you're thinking, wow, is the spirit separate from God or is it, you know, or it, it is God on one hand, on the other hand, it's, um, and, and early on in the Bible, you, you actually have um, uh, signs that, you know, like God is walking through the garden and, and is this, you know, um, and, and, and the, the, the Old Testament, um, uh, you know, the, the, the old, the ancient Jews, they were looking at this and going, wait, there seems to be a second Yahweh thing going on. So we saw the angel of the, the Lord character and how he's portrayed as Yahweh, but not Yahweh. And he speaks on behalf of God and is also treated as God. Um, but, and then we have examples of like the angel of the Lord appearing in stories of Gideon and, um, and of, uh, and, uh, Joshua and in, um, and also with, um, um, uh, Moses and Abraham. You have a question? Yeah, really quick. You know how in the Bible it says that humans are the only species that are united because of God? Mm -hmm. And so the angel is not the same thing as the tree. Oh, um, well, the Bible doesn't say, the, the Bible doesn't specify that we are, that nobody, no other thing is made in the, in the image of God, right? But the image of God isn't really, it doesn't really have as much to do apparently with the way things look. 
um, no, it's our position. And what it means is that when you, when you have, um, in the old language, when you have somebody in your image, that means that they represent you, okay? And it means that they, it's like, um, they, now it, it, it also, there is something about the way somebody looks and that, that can be a part of it, okay? But the, the main emphasis in the Bible about the image of God is that man is supposed to represent God on the earth. So we, that's why he put us over creation um, and, and, and meant that, you know, okay, so when, you know, like um, when, when ancient people used to worship idols, they would make an image, right? It's the same word, image. And what they believed was that, you know, this, this image um, is the embodiment of the God that we want to worship, right? And really what God was saying was like, you are the embodiment of me on the earth. You um, do my work. Therefore, I'm putting you over these things. So it's the it's the um, the image is more about um, your position of you know being God's representative on Earth. Um, so I think you know when you have the idea of sons of God and stuff like that that are spiritual beings that they are also made in the image of God, but not for the earth. It's, it's not their realm directly. They, they rule the heavens and other things, but um, they're probably in the image of God too, but it may, they may look nothing like us. Um, angels seem to, but de cherubim definitely don't look like us, you know, or some of the angels look like, seem to look like us, at least when they appear on earth. So um, we saw that um, that the angel of the Lord is also the peop the one who leads the people out of Egypt, and the word of the Lord is in him. God says, "I'm sending you my angel, and my word will be in him." And um, from then on, the, it's it confuses the language between whether Yahweh did something or the angel of the Lord did something and the word is in him. Now, we talked about the word and then the Old Testament, because remember, Jesus eventually starts being called the word, you know, and John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God, right? So the Old Testament has this idea of the word of the Lord being visible, almost like a visible person who was with God, the, the, um, the, the word. Um, and I'm going, going to bring some other examples how um, the Jews understood this. Um, the New Testament writers have this in mind. John is not creating this, this idea from, from scratch, you know, or introducing it for the first time. He is actually um, using the ideas that they already have in their minds, and that's what he's presenting in his gospel. Now, the New Testament writers see that Christ is the word of the Lord spoken in the Old Testament passages. We talked about the cloud rider and that, you know, um, the cloud rider was really ended up being only an, uh, a word or a phrase used for Yahweh. Um, the, the, the Baal worshipers used it for Baal, but then um, God, you know, like, uh, uh, but the writers started using things that Baal worshipers would say or whatever, but they would put God in the place, say, no, Baal is not the one who controls the weather and the skies and all that, you know, but, um, but God is the Yahweh is the cloud rider. But then you get in Daniel seven, this whole idea of the son of man riding on the cloud. So what is this man doing riding the clouds that puts him in the position of Yahweh? Yahweh is the, the cloud rider, right? And then later on, Jesus identifies himself as the cloud rider from Daniel 7. He says, today, uh, you know, you're going to see the Son of Man riding on the clouds and being seated um, on the throne next to the Father. So there were different um, interpretations in the time of, of, of Jesus or getting up into the time of Jesus. And there were speculations about who this second power such as the angel of the lord and who this cloud rider of daniel 7 was right before the new testament was ever written before these guys were ever writing about these things the jews were already speculating and writing about these things 
So we're, there were different candidates and a number of Jewish writers wrote about these. These are not um, scriptures that we have, but these are other writings besides the scriptures, okay? And this lasted all the way into the second century AD. So this goes a little bit beyond the time of Christ. Um, but with the rise of Christianity, once Christianity became you know, widespread, they quit writing about this because, and they started like pulling like a 180 and they started declaring it heresy. You know, well, we don't talk about, you know, the second Yahweh because that's, that's saying that there's more than one God. And they, you know, so they, they changed their tune um, because they were losing converts to Christianity because Christians were able to say, hey, the second Yahweh that you've been speculating about and writing about, um, this is Christ. And, um, and Christ fits this description. And they didn't like this. So they changed their tune. Uh, we see this all the time, like in, in politics or whatever, you know, it's like um, a party will say something until the other party starts saying something like it. And then we go, oh, no, that's not true. And then, and then they, then they um, uh, you know, they change their tune. But th this is just the way that, that um, uh, it was the politics of religion here, you know. Christianity started pointing out, you know, like who that Christ really fit the description of the second Yahweh figure, and then suddenly they stopped writing about it. So people were putting two and two together and figuring out that Jesus fits the categories that the scripture describes and that the Jewish writers had been speculating about. So here are some of the candidates that like these Jewish writers were talking about, okay? One of them was Adam, okay? Some of these are not gonna make any sense really i mean not if you think them through but you can kind of see like how they would think this so adam was a candidate they thought well maybe maybe the second yahweh figure is adam because he was the crowning point of creation and when he died maybe he, he became an angel right you know why an angel it it really doesn't make sense but it's kind of like it's kind of like belief that people have nowadays, you know, still, you know, oh, when you die, you go to heaven, you become an angel. There's people who think that way, you know, well, they weren't the first people to think that way. It was uh, Jews actually kind of thought that way, too. Another one was Jacob because he was Israel. OK, so the deification of Jacob, so Jacob becomes deified and he becomes an angel called Israel. So he was another one that these writers were writing about. Enoch, um, you know, you have the book of Enoch and everything, but one of the reasons they thought about Enoch was, well, Enoch never died. He walked with God and then he was no more. It seemed like he vanished, right? So in first Enoch, he is transformed and is called son of man actually in first Enoch. So I think it just means son of Adam in, the, in that, uh, uh, um, in that context, but, um, you know, people thought, well, maybe he is that son of man. Maybe he is that cloud rider because Enoch starts talking to the angels. Enoch start goes down to Hades and he starts preaching and condemning the angels that had fallen and everything. And he's, he's put on this mission and he's actually, there's one part of Enoch where, um, well, it's in second Enoch, he actually becomes clothed in glory. So second Enoch's a totally different book. It's, it's not even the same writer or anything. Um, but in second Enoch, he becomes clothed in glory and everything. And, and so a lot of people thought that Enoch was the second Yahweh figure. And then of course we have Moses because Moses, you know, he comes down from the mountain and he's the one who is closest to, to God, you know, and he, and he, uh, um, you know, he comes down shining and everything. And there's a, this mysterious thing that happens when, uh, you know, like what happened to him uh, in his grave and everything. Um, but there's the story that Moses uh, on Sinai gets close to God and is invited to sit on God's throne. That's not what we have in scripture, but it was one of the stories that they had floating around and, and that they actually wrote about. So... These were exalted humans. They also had important angels. One of them, and Cherie, you brought this up last time, was Michael. And um, so it's easy to see why people would think that Michael was the angel of the Lord. In fact, I, I think there are still Christians who, who, 
who wonder if it's Michael, right? There's some problems with that um, because, uh, but in any case, he's considered to be God, God's um, co-regent in heaven. So, you know, like Michael seems to be second in command or something. I don't know if that's true, but he is definitely over Israel. He, he became kind of like the patron angel for Israel, right? So in the Targums, uh, Michael is written in by the translators to identify him as the angel of the Lord. So let me explain what a Targum is, okay? A Targum is a translation of the Jewish um, Bible, the Old Testament, into Aramaic. And it wasn't just one translation. There were actually a lot of translations into Aramaic. Um, but what the writers of the, these Targums would do, and they were, these, were, these were Jewish translators, right? And they would take the Hebrew and they would translate the angel of the Lord and they would put Michael's name in there. So the translator was actually saying, oh, the angel of the Lord. Well, to make it clear, I'm just going to put Michael, you know. Um, Jerry, you had a question? Well, back to the Son of God. Mm -hmm. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire from mm -hmm. King of the Kings, I see when he, when he goes with three in at four of them, which is walking around. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. Now, how would he know? Or did God impress upon his heart oh. that was the Son of God? And he said, it looks like. The son of God. Has okay, uh, son yeah, of God. so so Jerry was asking, you know, like when Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were in the fiery furnace and um, uh, um, Nebuchadnezzar sees four people in there and he says, and the, the, there's a fourth one, and he looks like the son of God, right? Actually, if you look at the translation, it looks like it could read, um, and one of them looks like um, a son of the gods, um, it, I think that part is actually in Aramaic. Um, there's, there's only a little bit of the Bible that's in, that's originally in Aramaic. Be, so like, if you, if you look at the, um, if you look through like a, uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, you know, like a, a Hebrew, um, uh, you know, the, a translator, and you even see that in some of the notes or, no, no, he do, he does, but um, but yeah. So it's it you'll see it like in some of the footnotes, or it says or gods. So it could be that Nebuchadnezzar says like uh, he looks like one of the gods, or like one, the son of one of the gods, or whatever. So um, he, it's he's not thinking uh, he's not thinking Yahweh. Um, Nebuchadnezzar isn't thinking Yahweh, and he's not thinking um, he's thinking one of one of the gods. He's like. When he when he when he, he says, he yeah, he doesn't believe in God yet. No, um, he believes in God later on. Yeah, right. right yeah, but he that, but not at that point. And really, the translation um, probably should be. And he looks like one of the gods. He even says that, like when he when he says, "I want Daniel over here to," and, you know, they said, or uh, his servant says, because the spirit of the gods is in him. It's they're just saying, you know, like um, their understanding is like, man, this guy knows so much. This, the gods must be talking to this Daniel guy. They're not thinking this is because they're not thinking of God. And the, some of the translations will say, well, it's really God that we're talking about. And the translate that that's that's why you got to be you got to watch out for translators because translators will put their own understanding in there. But um, but the that that passage is plural. It appears that like um, and you know that that the fourth one looks like one of the gods, because that's that's just Nebuchadnezzar. That and that's what I think is going on there. So, um, and here's an example of like where you got to watch out for translators, including any everybody, King James to NIV, NIV or whatever. You know, it's like they do their best, but they're writing basically interpreting what they think is actually going on, right? So these Targums, um, which are Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible, the, these writers are putting Michael's name in where the angel of the Lord is. So they're taking that liberty going, well, this is the, you know, this angel of the Lord, it's obviously Michael. So I'm just going to write in Michael, 
you know, it's not right, but, um, but it shows you what they were thinking. They were thinking that like Michael might be this angel of the Lord character. Another one is Yael and Yael is, um, he's not Michael. He, if you look at the name Yael, it's, it's a short for Yahweh and then short for Elohim. So Yael or Yahweh and Elohim. And in the Apocalypse of Abraham, which is one of the, um, um, ex, you know, one of those books floating around, the writer takes the two names of God and combines them into the name of an angel. And in other texts, God is ref, uh, referred to as Yael as, as well. So, you know, like, so they're thinking like, well, there's a special angel out there. Maybe it's Michael, maybe this other angel. And one, one writer actually just kind of makes one up called Yael. Um, and then, or maybe it's like one of these exalted humans here in Philo, Philo, now Philo is this Jewish philosopher, um, kind of a, um, uh, you know, religious, um, philosophical Jewish guy or whatever. He starts writing about this thing called the Logos, or he starts talking about the Logos in the Bible. Now, um, he lived um, between like, I think eight, um, uh, 20 BC and 50 AD. So he's like right around Jesus's time. And he's pretty well known. If you're really, really educated at the time, you're probably familiar with, um, Philo's logos. So somebody like Paul was really familiar with like somebody like Philo's writings, right? So Philo has this idea of the logo logos, which is the word and, it, and his idea is that the word is the conduit through which um, God does things. So it, this is not a new idea that the word is, um, is, is God in some way and, and that God works through the word. So he refers to Logos as the second God in the, his commentary in Genesis. So he actually, when he does his commentary on Genesis, he calls the Logos the second God, the second Yahweh. And the only difference between Philo's Logos and John's Logos, uh, Logos, because John says in the beginning was the Logos and the word was Logos, um, the, the Logos was with God and the Logos, that's, that's the word, you know, it's, um, it's Greek, right? So uh, is that Philo sees the Logos uh, apparently as something that God created. Um, and not, he doesn't quite e equate it with God, but he does call it the second God figure for some reason. So these ideas are already floating out there. Now here we have a word called memra. Okay, that's, that's also in Aramaic and uh, it appears widely in the Targums. The memra uh, is, is just another word for the, you know, in Greek it's log logos for the word in Aramaic, the word for um, word is memra, okay? And if you look at like examples in the Targums, uh, it says like in Genesis 3, 9, it says, but the memra of the Lord God called to man and said, where are you? So it says, but the word of the Lord God called to the man and says, where are you? So that, 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 that person in the Bible that is, um, is, you know, in the garden, communicating with Adam and Eve is referred to as the word here in the, in the Targums. And also um, it says in Genesis, um, so the memra of God created man in his own image. And think of it, it you know, the word of God created man in his own image. And here's um, some of like what you were talking about, Ravel, is that, um, you know, they're thinking that you know the word of God is this person, um, and He creates man in His own image. That's what like they're they're thinking when they're writing down these translations, right? So, um, and then finally, and you've probably heard of this word Shekinah uh, in in Aramaic. It's called Shekinka, and it comes from the word to dwell. So, like it was God's presence dwelling in the temple, his Shekinah glory. It's a different word from glory than, than what we found in Ezekiel. But whatever filled the, um, uh, uh, whatever we filled the temple, I, I shouldn't say Ezekiel because the Shekinah appears in Ezekiel. 
But whatever fills the temple, okay, it was the glory put into form. It was this, um, the glory of God that was in human form. So the Shekinah is the presence of God personified. So in, for example, in the Targums, it is the Shekin Kad that passes by Moses by the cleft of the rock. So when Moses goes to the mountaintop and God puts him in the cleft of the rock and passes by him, it says in the Targums, they, they say the word of the Lord passed by Moses on the cleft of the rock. So again, it's not just word, like there's nothing there about spoken, spoken. It's just like the, 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 the word of God passes by, um, the, um, by Moses in the cleft of the rock. So, and it was also used, um, this memra was used for the second Yahweh, but also of the spirit. So um, they weren't just using the word um, to refer to as the, the second Yahweh figure, but they were also using it for the spirit. So here now we see a fusion of all three, Yahweh, the second power, and the spirit are all um, referred to as the Shekinah or the Shekinka in the Targans. So there were Jews thinking of a three-part Godhead before the New Testament in some kind of way. So it was not a brand new idea. It was something that they were starting to figure out just from the Old Testament. So when we get into the New Testament, the first disciples, first the disciples are confronted with, okay, Jesus is the Messiah, but they don't really start, you know, like the Messiah figure wasn't necessarily in the minds of the Jews, the same thing as the second Yahweh figure or the angel of the Lord figure, okay? But eventually they're starting to figure out that Jesus is not just the Messiah, but he is also the second Yahweh figure. And so the speculations of who this figure would be in the Memra, you know, the word and, and all these speculations that were um, going on in, in uh, the second um, temple period um, is, is start, they're starting to figure out that like, wait a minute, um, they're speculating about um, who Christ really is. Christ is representing all of this, right? So as the New Testament is being rip, written, the write, writers draw on all of these, uh, these, all of this stuff and terminology, and they actually use it on purpose. Paul uses it on purpose. Um, of course, we have in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Um, he was in the beginning with God. So just a refresher now, um, remember that the angel of the Lord, God is telling them that the angel of the Lord is going to go before them and lead them out of Egypt, okay? And we see that in Exodus 23. Who leads, who leads the people out of Egypt? Well, yeah, it's Yahweh, but it's also, but it's also this angel of the Lord, right? That, that um, and then if you look at Judges, it has this verse in, in verse one, it says, now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgam to Bochum. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and I brought you into the land that I swore to give your father. So it's the, the angel of the Lord that's speaking. And he said, I will never break my covenant with you. But if you go down to Jude, it says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. That's an incredible verse, right? It's like it here, Jude is saying that it was Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward and destroyed those who did not believe. We also know that it was um, the, the angel of the Lord that, that um, destroyed those who believed. So Jude is, is directly, uh, equating the angel of the Lord character um, to Jesus. Jesus is the angel of the Lord. This, by the way, this is why it doesn't make sense for it to, there's this and other, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense for it to be Michael, it, you know. <clears throat> also, um, the name, okay. In John 17, Jesus um, uses the name, okay? And he says, I have manifested, he's praying to God. He says, I have manifested your name to the people 
<clears throat> whom you gave me out of the world. Remember the name represented God's presence, okay? And um, also the, the God's presence there sometimes in physical form, right? I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and I have kept your word. That's that word, word again. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have made known to them your name. It's, it's not as if the Jews didn't know the name Yahweh, okay? He's not talking about the name Yahweh. He's talking about um, that I've basically made your presence known to them, right? It's like, I've made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So it's not, um, again, the name is not just, a, you know, like, I, it makes no sense for for jesus to be saying yeah i i made your name yahweh or the i am known to the jews the jews knew that for you know thousands of years already you know he's talking about something else he's talking about the 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 very presence of god and the very um uh nature of god <clears throat> here let's talk about wisdom and apagasma apagasma is something else okay but let's talk about wisdom now, in Proverbs 8, wisdom is personified, and we see um, hints. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit more vague, and it's a little harder to figure out sometimes that wisdom is also equated with God himself. Because on one hand, you know, God, um, you know, like wisdom is portrayed as being there before anything else is made. So in a sense, wisdom is not like the rest of creation as a created thing. Um, and the thing that makes, conf makes it confusing to us sometimes is that wisdom is portrayed in Proverbs 8 um, as a woman, which, you know, like it doesn't, you know, like you, the son of God is not portrayed as a woman. That's, that doesn't make sense. The, the reason that it looks like that in our translations is because of the word she, right? And we talked about like how languages in languages um, that use, you know, Spanish is like this, where they use like, uh, um, th they use masculine and feminine things for like, you know, like the stairs could be masculine, that chair could be feminine or whatever. And you just call it, you know, like we still call ships she, it has nothing to do with a, a ship being female. Um, it's just that like, that's the way that languages have like often divided things up. Um, you know, so when you talk about wisdom and you're going to use it, use the surrounding language with it, um, then you use wisdom in the feminine sense, but it's not like, it's not like she's being, uh, uh, that wisdom is being portrayed necessarily as a woman. It's just the way that the Hebrew um, seems to uh, well, it's, it's because the he Hebrew um, uh, language rules, right? So there is wisdom personified. And then when you get, um, there's, there's a, a place here in Wisdom of Solomon, which again is not in our Bible. I think Wisdom of Solomon is in the Catholic Bible. I think it's in the, it's actually in the, um, uh, in the Apocrypha. But here's a passage and it, it's, this is going to lead up to like something that Paul uses, okay? It's, it's verse 22 in Wisdom of Solomon. It says, I will tell you what wisdom is and how she came to be. Um, and I will hide no secrets from you, but I will trace her course from the beginning of creation. Again, this is originally in Hebrew, so it's not necessarily a she, okay? If this was another language, it would be he. Um, but it's just personified. But I will trace the course from the beginning of creation and make knowledge of her clear. I will not pass by the truth. In other words, if this was another language, it would read something like, I will tell you that wisdom is and how he came to be, and I will hide no secrets from you, I, but, I will con cons but I will trace his course from the beginning of creation and make knowledge of him clear. I will not pass by the truth, okay? So that's, that's how I could read it in another language. But she or he is reflection, an apogasma. Remember that word, apogasma. 
a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, okay? The, uh, an image of his goodness. Apogosma is a very, very rare word. You hardly ever find it, and Paul ends up using it uh, once, okay? And he uses it in Hebrews. He says, long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, who he appointed the heir of all things through whom he created the world. He is the radiance or the re reflection or the image, the apogosma of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature when he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He's using this wisdom language that you see in the wisdom of Solomon and in Proverbs, um, but he's using um, this very rare word, uh, which is translated reflection here um, in the wisdom of, Sol um, uh, of Solomon. But it's the same word here, radiance. You could say he's the exact um, reflection or the re exact representation of the glory of God. Um, it, it's this word apogosma. So, um, so Paul is using um, some of the things that's, that have already been written and they sound very much the same. And here, remember what we, we talked about glory, how glory was, you know, the same as God, you know, like um, in, in Ezekiel, um, God's glory was also God or God personified. He is the apogosma of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So you have like three of those things right there. Um, that um, seem to be um, not God, but yet God. So Jesus, the wisdom of God. Now here, um, there's two writers, Luke and Matthew, and they're, they're both telling the same story or the same part of the story. This is where Jesus starts laying into some of the rulers and some of the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and he, and he starts, um, and so it's the same context, both for Luke and Matthew 23. So this is what we call a parallel passage where it, it's the same setting, but Matthew and Luke write it slightly differently, okay? Here's what Luke says. Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying this, by the way, this should all be like in red letter, right? It says, therefore, also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, right? The passage in Matthew says this, therefore I send, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, some who you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. So in Luke, it says the wisdom of God said, Jesus is using the word wisdom of God. In Matthew, it says, I will send you prophets. I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. So Jesus, um, uh, so between those two passages, we see the equation of the wisdom of God as Jesus. You know, so, um, and I, um, they didn't plan it that way or anything like that. That's just the, the Bible telling you that Jesus is the wisdom of God. And I think that's one of the, the, the best um, references. I love this reference. And that's basically um, kind of like um, it today. I, I didn't really have a conclusion about it, um, but I just wanted to kind of like get through some more of those um, passages to um, to show how, um, you know, that the Old Testament and people from the, from the time of the Old Testament into the time of Jesus were thinking about those things. They had parts of the picture right, parts of them were not right. Some of them were thinking it's one of the important humans in the Bible. Others were thinking, well, it's maybe got to be somebody like Michael, or maybe it's another angel that we don't know of, like this Yael. They wrote about all this kind of stuff. And sometimes they would just go ahead and make conclusions. And then they, you'd see it in the translations when they, when they translated from Hebrew into Aramaic. 
Um, sometimes you get clues of it when they translate things into Greek. Um, you know, like what the, the translators are thinking, what they have in their mind. Translators are often wrong, um, uh, but um, uh, because they're trying to fill in the blanks for the reader, but, um, but at least it shows you what they have in their mind. And it wasn't just that like the New Testament writers came along and Jesus came along and then all of a sudden you have an idea of the Trinity. That was something that was baking um, in the minds of Old Testament readers from the beginning. It's always been there. You know, it's just that as things got revealed more and more, um, once you take all those little pieces, Jesus just fit all those pieces. It was like um, he fit all the Messiah pieces and he fit all of the word of God pieces and the wisdom and the second Yahweh, angel of the Lord, the, the glory of God, um, the, you know, the apogosma, the radiance of God. Um, all of those things get, um, get wrapped up in Christ. Christ ended up being all those things. And, one, and, and it took the, you know, the disciples didn't understand all of this at first. You still have a lot of questions in the time of Acts, but in Acts, it's starting to like, they're starting to get it. They're starting to get it. And when you read, by the time you get to Paul, Paul um, knows his Old Testament. He also knows, you know, like the, the Targums and he knows Philo's thinking and he knows um, he knows, you know, the, the apocalypse of Abraham and he knows the book of Enoch and he knows all of those things. And he's going, wait, all these things that these guys were speculating about, this is what Jesus is. And he starts writing about that. So, um, some of that we kind of miss because we're not familiar with the Targums. We're not that familiar with, you know, the apocalypse of Abraham and some of the other, um, uh, apocalyptic books but and all of their speculations but but paul is drawing from all of that and going what that writer's thinking about right there he might be off a little bit but um he's seeing something but it's not M michael it's christ it's not adam it's christ it's not moses it's christ it's not this yael character it's christ you know and um that's um really what you have in in the new testament and what really gets portrayed in there. So anybody got questions, comments about this? Or? It's an interesting little angle, huh? Sometimes you never, you know, you never uh, think about this, but, um, um, but once you, um, and I think a lot of times what's happened is that critics have gone, you know, well, you know, People were thinking, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff at Jesus's time, and he was just another one to kind of come along and, you know, like and, and try to fit the bill or whatever. And you know, it's like, um, no, you know what? He fit the bill like um, perfectly, and um, and it wasn't that just that these writers were off in left field; they were thinking about it, and they were conservative Jews. These were not like fringe people writing this stuff this this stuff was taken seriously and they're being um handled by serious scribes and serious priests were talking about this this wasn't like some you know like uh uh these were and they did not think that it was um blasphemy to be talking about this stuff they didn't think it was blasphemy to be talking about a second yahweh they didn't think it was blasphemy they they turned it into uh they started calling it blasphemy um, around the, the second century when they quit writing about it because they wanted to paint the Christians as being blasphemous and kind of like, you know, like, oh, well, it's not really anything that we, and you'll go online and, you know, you'll see like if you Google like Jewish Trinity, um, you might see a, a couple um, Christian um, uh, scholars who are talking about this, you know, things that I talked about today, but you have like a lot of pushback by like um, Jewish communities are going, oh, you got it all wrong. We never believed that. And, you know, and it's like, uh, it's like, no, we have the writings there. Just, just read what they thought um, about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was another one. I didn't, I didn't bring him up um, today. 
Um, but Melchizedek was another person that they thought was, you know, he was like the, the high priest who, who um, before there ever was a, a Jewish priesthood, he becomes the, the priest of Salem or of, of Shalem, right? Or of Jew. And so he's ruling in Jerusalem at the time of Abraham long before the Jewish um, nation and um, Abraham actually tithes to Melchizedek. Um, and we're like, uh, um, and so he's like kind of a mystery figure later on. Um, Paul actually used Melchizedek and he talks about Melchizedek in, in Hebrews. And he says, you know what? Um, Mel Jesus is greater than Melchizedek. And Jesus is greater than any of the angels because Melchizedek is a, is a priest and he's very important and he's a mysterious figure, but he's not Christ. And Michael is important and he's a great figure and an important angel, but he's not Christ because to whom of the angels did, did Christ say, come and sit at my right hand and sit by my throne. He didn't say that to Michael or any of the angels. So that's the, where they're, where, um, Paul starts arguing from he, because people were speculating, well, maybe the second Yahweh uh, uh, figure, the cloud rider guy, maybe he's Melchizedek or something like that, you know. So, Cherie, you had a question? And you're muted, by the way. Cherie, you have um, your hand raised, but you're muted. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, I had heard that Melchizedek was a Christophany of Christ. Is that not true then? It, that he was what? A Christophany of Christ. Like uh, Christ? No, I don't think so. No? Um, okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the reason. Well, let, let, let's go to Hebrews, okay? Um, and... Um, I'm gonna have to Google real quickly, because um, this this is this is a pretty good question actually. Um, let's see what Paul says about um, um, uh, let me see. It's in Hebrews. Yeah. Okay, Hebrews. Four fourteen. Okay, so starting from Hebrews four fourteen, it says, "Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confessions." Um. Where does he mention Melchizedek again? Okay. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So there was some um, there was some parallel that um, that he was taught that that Paul is drawing on um, between Melchizedek and Christ. After, again in verse ten. Um, and being made perfect, he became a, the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And um, so Paul is using that as, as, a, as a parallel to Melchizedek. You, you got a point there, Rachel? Uh-huh. Six twenty. Again, throughout the entire chapter seven. Okay, we have. We about so where Je where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, um, the priestly order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, King of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, and. To him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. Here's something that, like, in the narrative of Abraham, 
God promises Abraham that those who bless you will bless, uh, will be blessed and those who curse you will be cursed, right? Mm -hmm. And the first person that we see blessing Abraham is Melchizedek. And Melchizedek ends up being blessed. And then later on, when we see people um, cursing Abraham and his uh, offspring or whatever, they end up being cursed, you know, like the Egyptians and, um, you know, others. But, you know, it would seem really odd to me if in, if in that narrative, which, which it's really part of the narrative, that, that, like, that Jesus is blessed because he blesses Israel, you know? So um, in the story of Melchizedek, you know, he is a mysterious figure and he's a lofty figure. There's really nothing bad said about him. Abraham is, he even pays him a tithe. Um, but you would pay, you know, like tithes went to the priests anyway, even later on. And so what you have is that you, um, he is originally in Genesis, the, 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 the priest of El, El Yon, or the, you know, like the most high. Um, but I think he comes to, there's a hint there, and I, I, I'm going to have to look it up, that he actually gets, starts, um, he, um, he professes faith in, um, in Yahweh, the most high, but I don't know if he is originally, but it, it would just be kind of awkward if Melchizedek is blessed by God because he blesses Abraham. Mm -hmm. So that that's like one thing. And then um, he is, okay, so let's, and to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth of part of everything. He is the first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, which that is king of peace. So Melchizedek is called the king of righteousness and he is called the peace, but it's like a type. I don't think that this is a, a Christophany. Um, I think this is like a, a type. He's definitely a type of Christ, right? Um, I don't know if I've really talked about types, but like um, types are like in the, the Christian, in the, the biblical stories, sometimes you have, okay, remember when Abraham sacrifices, you know, goes to sacrifice his son, then his mm -hmm. son becomes a type of Christ. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, and Abraham becomes the type of the father, you know, that's going to sacrifice his own son. His son is the one who carries the wood up the hill. They go to the same place that's probably like where Christ ends up being crucified thousands of years later. It's Mount Moriah, which for all we know could be the same thing as um, where the Temple Mount was and where Golgotha is, you know, and, and all that. So, um, you know, that, that's what a type is. So um, another example of the type is like when Abraham's servant um, goes and finds uh, the son of bride or whatever, then, you know, he starts all of a sudden that servant that we know the name of doesn't get, his name doesn't get mentioned. And you see that whenever an, a servant's name isn't mentioned, like in the book of Ruth and stuff like that, that they're, they're playing a type of the Holy Spirit and that there's, uh, there's a, uh, that, that's what a type is. Okay. Um, it's a symbolic sort of like replacement of, uh, uh, of something bigger. Um, he is without father and mother. So, no father and mother is mentioned for Mel Melchizedek by ge genealogy. This is done on purpose, by the way. They would say they would not mention somebody's genealogy here because they want the writers trying to get you to think a certain way. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law that to take tithes from the people that is from their brothers, though these are also descendants of Abraham. So it's, in other words, it's almost like saying all of Israel gave tithes to this guy named Melchizedek. But this man who does not have his descent from them receives the tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. 
it is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one whom, of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives the tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. Yeah, that's kind of like what I was saying, that even the, the priests through Abraham are, are pay, were paying tithe, uh, paid tithes to Melchizedek. For he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met, met him. So Jesus compared to Melchizedek. Okay, so now if per perfection had been attain attainable through the Levitical priesthood, which is very far from imperfect, it was screwed up from the start, right? Um, hmm. What further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the, the one from Aaron? So Aaron was messed up. Melchizedek seems pretty legit. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one to whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah and in connection with that tribe. Um, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. So you have here likeness, who has become who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement because this wasn't Melchizedek wasn't a legal re required. This was before Israel existed, right? Concerning mm -hmm. bodily descent, but by the power of in, an indestructible life. Um, for it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, which we find in Psalms one ten four, and there. He seems to be talking to David, but also to the Messiah. For one, um, yeah, so, you know, like I would go through this kind of slowly there. I could definitely see when that's why, you know, I said it, it's a good question. Um, and I could definitely see why somebody would think so. Um, is it possible? Yeah, maybe. I, I really don't think so. Um, not because mainly because we're talking about a man here. We're not, that, we're, we're talking about like somebody who did live and die at that time. Okay. So it's not like, um, it, it's not like the, 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 um, uh, the angel of the Lord who would come in the form of a man, but just, and then just disappear. Melchizedek was somebody who was a king also in Salem. Um, so he did have a history there. And I don't think it was, it, it's just not, Christ wouldn't like just come and live one life and then come back and live another life. Uh, that's just not, uh, that, that didn't happen, you know? So um, uh, yeah, I, it, it just doesn't work for me. You, know? you had another question, Shereen, and, and by the way, you're muted again. Uh, no, that it was the same question. Then it changed my mind. Then I said, oh, I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, it, it's, it's a good question. I, I think I've heard that before. And, and Paul talks about Melchizedek. So, you know, like, you know, comparing him, you know, but really what he's referring to him is there is like, as Melchizedek is written in as a type. And it's also like Melchizedek is not just a, a priest, but he's a king priest, a priest king, um, which nobody else really does. Um, you know, like um, the priests were not kings and David was a, a king, but he was not a priest. And so there you have a king of righteousness and you have this priest figure, but he's also a historical figure who was a king and a priest at the time. So it's not like we're like, you know, you have Melchizedek and then later on gets, you know, like reborn as Christ or whatever. I don't, that's just, you know, that, well, that doesn't work for me. Well, it, it really helps to keep on reading. Uh -huh. Even like us through Dr. King and stuff. Right. But even like right after you stop reading in chapter seven, uh -huh. it's like, yeah, Melchizedek is, is oh, okay. a okay. better Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I was actually looking for. Um, 
uh, yeah. covenant, those kind of words, like better promises. Okay. The old, the old covenant was For an, had faults, and we needed a second covenant. Right. And that's like uh, chapter 8, verse 7. Um, but even here in verse 23, the former priests were many in number because they prevented, you know, that he holds his priesthood permanently and he continues forever. So yeah. Melchizedek, did, his priesthood didn't last forever, right? Consequently, we, he is able to save the, uh, to the utmost those who draw near to God. And then in chapter 8, yeah, he builds on this. Really uh, just, uh, what what just verse like, are you looking at? Um, well, for for every high every high priest is appointed and offers gifts to now we are um they caught they do the, 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 but well, as like chapter eight you know verse six but as it is christ has obtained yeah ministry, but as it is christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent as than right. the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises um but as it is um but anyway jesus is the new covenant yeah jesus is the new covenant now he, he, to be fair he is talking about you know the 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 covenant priests you know like in from leviticus on um but you know like there was there was no if if um, Melchizedek was like the, the the priest, then he wouldn't have had to. Um, there there have been no need to have a, a better priest. You know, why would you have Melchizedek? Um, why not just have Melchizedek be the priest? You know, so I, I don't know. It doesn't really, it you know, it doesn't work for me. But, um, Melchizedek was a historical figure. But he's written as a type of Christ, for sure. Yeah. A type and shadow. Types and shadows, which is a theological term. Kind of. All right. <laughs> so types and shadows. Maybe we should do a thing on types and shadows. It's a, uh, like once you see it, you just like, Boy, the, I mean, like the scripture is just so rich with types and shadows, but it's not like when you say, oh, he's a type of Christ, then people think in their mind, oh, he's kind of a Christ. It's, it's not that. It's, uh, it's, it's the way that the writers um, will portray somebody as fulfilling like a pre-story. Samson, Samson is a type of Christ, um, as types of Christ. If you read the beginning of the Samson story and then compare it to the Luke and compare it to Luke, the Christmas story. And you're going to see all kinds of stuff there that like Luke draws on, you know, um, anyway, you, you were smiling about something. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. There's more, more than 200 names of titles of Jesus in the Bible. Okay. And he just made the, like several of them, but it would be a good study on our own to look up all the names and titles of Jesus without the entire Bible because it goes along with all of this. Because you start to really see a big picture um, of who he is. Okay. I, I don't, I don't think they can hear you. you, you if, can you even hear Rachel? No, they can't hear you. I can kind of hear, but not clearly. Now, Rachel is saying that, like, um, um, uh, Pastor Jerry over at um, uh, Cornerstone was talking about all the names of Christ, and that there's, like, over 200 or something in the scripture. Wow. And names and titles of Jesus. And... and um, and those reveal all kinds of things about about Christ and who He is. Yeah. Well, um, I guess that's about it for tonight, then. You know. So. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome, and I'll see you guys next week. Have a week. good week, everybody.
Thank okay, you. you too. Have a nice, have a great week. All right, happy Easter. Yeah, bye. Thank That's right. Happy Easter, everybody. Yeah. All right. Goodbye.